We have arrived at the final video of the semester. This is part two of two for chapter 19. Uh, hopefully the lighting will work out better than the last one. It was real dark on uh, the last video. So this is the last video uh, for the semester. And just thinking about a schedule, as I mentioned in part one, um, there'll be a Blackboard quiz slash exam over this on uh, Wednesday the 29th. It'll kick on at 10 in the morning, uh, right after office hours that morning. And then it'll go until Friday, uh, May 1st at midnight. And so you come to office hours on Thursday evening at 7, Friday morning at 9. And that's the last regular day of the semester. No true final this semester, but on Wednesday, May 6th, there will be an optional Blackboard quiz slash exam. It will just basically run for 24 hours on May 6th. And it's entirely optional. If you do great on it, I will replace your worst score on your previous five Blackboard uh, quiz slash exams. And so there is no penalty if you do poorly on it. It is basically, like I said in part one, it's a free chance to improve your scores. Here's a quick review from part one. This is problem 6B on page 804. It's complete this nuclear reaction. It's add the nuclide that's on the reactant side of this process. And if you look at the right side, you should hopefully recognize that this is beta decay. Because there's the electron right there on the far right. And so it's beta decay. If you get your periodic table, everything's going to have to balance. So let's look at the top row. The mass is 233 over on the right, so it's still 233 on this side. The atomic number has to work out mathematically, and so we've got a 92 and a negative 1. And so if we combine those together, this will be 91. On your periodic table, that is element Pa. The name of that is proactinium, and so in this case, just like our beta decay in part one, element number goes up one when you have beta decay. So we went from 91 to 92. Well, the focus of this portion is going to be on bombardment reactions and energy. And what a bombardment reaction is, it's very different than natural radioactivity. Because what we're going to be doing is going to be smashing two things together and then we're going to make brand new elements. This is how the large elements have been made, by smashing together two smaller nuclei, and then they fuse together. And we're also going to see if you smash a neutron into something, then you can split an atom. And so this is going to be having multiple reactants, quote unquote, and then multiple products. Here's a practice problem for you. Element 117, the symbol is TS was discovered by colliding a calcium isotope with a mass of 48 and 249 berkelium. And those two got smashed together. The TS was made along with three neutrons. Try to write the balanced nuclear reaction. having trouble, I'll get you started. Here's the calcium, 48 for a mass, it's element 20 on the periodic table. The mass of the other ingredient is given, 249, symbol BK. If you check your periodic table, that is element 97. If you add these two together, you notice there's your 117. We smashed the two nuclei together. All the protons will remain. We're also going to produce um, some neutrons. And so the protons are 117 in the new product because that's why it's element 117. Here's the part you have to be careful on. You can't just add these two numbers together and get the mass over here because you also produce neutrons. 
I am actually going to write these out separately to help us think about it. And so if we add up the total mass of these two together and then subtract three, that will give us the mass of that isotope. And that ends up being 294, because we add those two together, you get 297. And so that's the mass of the TS. If you add all the way across, we've got one, two, three neutrons. And so that adds up to a total of 297. Everything has to balance. Typically, when you write a reaction, though, we won't write it like that. I just wanted to emphasize that. Typically, this would be written as three neutrons instead of writing them out individually. But I wanted to emphasize the total mass. But typically, that's how you'd write this three neutrons right there. The answer still comes out the same, um, but I want to emphasize the individual. Skip the next slide on measuring radiation with the Geiger counter. There's a picture of Einstein, or sketch, not a picture. He said mass and energy are interconvertible. What equation is he talking about there? It's the most famous equation in science. I tell people it's the only one you can put on a t-shirt. It's so famous. He's talking about E equals mc squared. And he's basically saying that energy and mass are equivalent to each other and you can interconvert them. And so there's your energy. M is mass. C is the speed of light. 3 times 10 to the meters per second. And then you square it. So you can think about this. That's a big number, 3 to the 8th. You're squaring it times the mass. When you convert a small amount of mass and energy, produces a large amount of energy. Here are some of the main uses for it. There are plenty of medical uses for it. You can use it in cancer therapy to try to knock out a tumor. Uh, it's used in many medical tests. You can generate electricity through nuclear power plants. That's a controversial issue. And then of course, you can harness this energy in atomic weapons. We'll see uh, two and three emphasis later. And so, if you had an atomic bomb that converted 50 grams, it's like two ounces of material, 0.05 kilograms of the unit we need, if you use E equals mc squared, how much energy is produced if you just convert 0.05 kilograms? So working with that equation, I really want to emphasize the units on here. Your mass must be in kilograms when you do a test question. Then we multiply by the speed of light squared. So when you put all that in your calculator, you should get four 0.5 times 10 to the 15th. And we have a lot of units on this right now. It's kilograms times meter squared times second squared. That's the definition of a joule, all those units. So we can change that right to joules. So it's 4.5 times 10 to the 15th joules. Blackboard online quiz slash exam. Make sure any mass you use is in kilograms and your answer will come out in joules. If it's in grams, be careful. You're going to have to switch it over to kilograms. And so that's a very large amount of energy. You're just converting, like I said, roughly two ounces of material is being converted. And if you compare that to candy bar per se, 
uh, like 50 grams of glucose in a candy bar or a container of energy drink uh, produce about 800 kilojoules, so that's 800,000 joules, but if you can convert that same material into energy um, by an energy to mass switch, uh, you produce a lot more energy. So that's why nuclear power um, can be efficient at times. There are a lot of factors involved. So now we'll look at a chain reaction. This will talk, this will show us how nuclear power plants and some nuclear weapons work. So here is one of those bombardment reactions where we took a neutron and you smash it into a U-235 nucleus. And then you would say that U-235 nucleus is fissionable because it splits in half and produces a barium, a krypton, and three more neutrons. And here are the masses of all of these ingredients. One neutron has a mass of 1.009 grams per mole. There's your U-235 nucleus, there's your barium, krypton, and those are your three neutrons on the other side. So grab your calculator. Make this a multiple choice question on the next slide. Pause the video when the question comes up on the next slide. With your calculator, when you compare the masses of the products to the reactants in this reaction, I'll go to the next slide with the question. And what conclusion can you draw when you compare the total mass of the reactants versus the products? So pause the video when the question comes up and see what you think. choices on here. When you add up the products versus the reactants, the products have a slightly smaller mass. The total differs by 0.186 grams, as we'll see. And that mass difference is the mass that has been converted to energy. We call it the mass defect. It's missing mass, but it's just been changed over to energy. It's not very much. And so here's a picture of the process that's going on. One neutron hits the nucleus, you see it's splitting apart, and so the mass of this material over here is slightly lower than the two ingredients over here. And we can calculate that, it's kind of a bonus question I call it, Using E equals mc squared, let's calculate the energy per mole, because that's the 0.186, that's grams, it's really per mole. And so, in E equals mc squared, watch your units again. There's your C down there. And so, E equals 0 0.186 times 10 to the negative third kilograms. So I have to switch that. And then I multiply it again by C squared. And even this small amount of mass will produce a good amount of energy. Check my sheet here, make sure I have the right number. It is 1.7. Uh, 1.67 times 10 to the 13. And once again, those units come out to be kilojoules, or sorry, kilograms, meters squared per second squared. That will default to joules. And so just think about 0.186 grams. That's less than an MM. And that if all of that was converted to uh, energy, that's the amount it would produce. Something else you notice about the reaction, it produces three neutrons. We started with one. What's the importance of producing three neutrons? 
This is where the chain part comes in. Because if you look at that picture from the textbook, the three neutrons that are produced on the right can then hit three more atoms of U-235, and then you get more fission. And so this is why these reactions are very fast and produce a lot of energy. Here's kind of an animated GIF that shows it. You can see that first neutron smashes in, and then there's your krypton, and there's your barium, and then you can see the three neutrons that are produced hit three more nuclei, and you get all kinds of different products involved, and so there's a real complex soup um, that results. Some of the products are radioactive, as we'll see, um, and so you get a lot of energy produced, and it happens very quickly. And so now we'll talk about some of these uses. Here's a picture of the bomb called Little Boy. This was the first atomic weapon dropped at the end of World War II. And so um, this was dropped in 1945. And so this is the bomb. It's not that big. It's uh, 3.2 meters. And so it's right about 10 feet long. And so the bomb itself is not that large. And the way a bomb like this works, is that it has a, a large amount of U-235, or I guess relatively large amount, it takes about 35 pounds, and it's split into two pieces. And so you put some of your uranium-235 on one end, and then you put the other part down here on this end. The two pieces themselves cannot explode a nuclear process. And so this is called a gun-type bomb. And so a high explosive, shoots some of the U-235 down into the other one, the two subcritical masses make a critical mass, and then the nuclear process happens. And so it takes a chemical explosive to get it started. And then there you can see when it, when it hits it, then it explodes in a nuclear process. And you need about 30 pounds of mostly pure uranium-235. We'll see in a moment the U-238 is not used in a weapon and it causes the problem of nuclear waste in nuclear power plants. Here's a quick review question thinking about uranium-235. So uh, pause the video and try this question. true statement on this one is statement C. The ultimate nuclides are more stable than the original U-235. And so the new products you make, whether it be barium, krypton, or other, or other products also involved, um, you're going to a more stable place. That's what drives radioactivity. Page 863 in your textbook um, shows a picture of a nuclear power plant. If you've ever driven by one or seen one in a movie, um, this is the, the main building that you see right there. That's called the containment building. It's a concrete shell um, that contains the reactor. And here's the basic setup. They're, they're in some ways simple, in some ways incredibly complex. And so the way they work is that there are fuel rods right here that contain semi-purified uranium-235. It only has to be purified to about 3 or 5 percent, but the fuel rods contain small amounts of uranium-235. The bulk of it is actually still uranium-238. The material in there is not pure enough to make a nuclear weapon, so even if someone stole it, they couldn't make a nuclear bomb out of the fuel rods. and so. They're kind of yellowish in here. Those are the fuel rods, and so the reaction is going, and then these control rods are actually used to stop the reaction in the emergency, and they are neutron absorbers. If the reaction is going too quickly and gets out of hand, rods are lower, they absorb more neutrons, the 
process stops. The reaction is going too slowly. They raise the rods and then the process happens some more. And heat is produced by the reaction. And what it does is it heats up a fluid, usually it can be pressurized water or even something like liquid sodium. And you can see it in this orange pipe here. And then the heat is exchanged with some water in here. That's, that's turned into steam. That steam goes and turns a turbine. And then that produces some electricity. And so ultimately, it's two separate closed systems where you have this water over here that is continually turned into steam and then recondensed in these big cooling towers and then it comes back and it's turned into steam again and then there's the part that occurs inside the containment building here in the shell and so they're two separate closed systems that operates at very high pressure they're very complicated uh, because they have a lot of pumps and they have to deal with very high pressures. And if the nuclear process gets out of hand, let's say the plant loses power or something and this overheats, this containment shell blows up in a chemical explosion and spews the ingredients around here. Here's another animated GIF that shows sort of the whole process. And so here's the reactor vessel with the fuel rods see that material is being pumped through that and then the water is being turned into steam here and then that's going through the turbine and then there's it's cooled back to liquid water and then your generator sends electricity out to your house and so that's the process like I said it's um, they're conceptually very simple but very complicated to operate Let's just briefly look at some pros and cons of nuclear power because this is an issue facing society. You as future citizens of this country or current citizens and future working adults living in communities, we have to make a decision. Do we want to build more nuclear power plants? Some of the pros to nuclear power. When they're operating, they're fairly inexpensive to operate. Right down here is a condo, they're going to be expensive to build. The United States has not built one in many years. There are a number of them still operating. They produce about 20% of our electricity, so they're very important in terms of electro output. When they're operating, typically they don't have any greenhouse gas emissions, so there's no CO2 emitted while operating. Mining and semi-purifying the uranium-235, though, actually does produce a good amount of carbon dioxide. When the plant is operating, um, they are not, it is not producing carbon dioxide. The, the two other big cons are probably the potential for terrorism and then nuclear waste, as we'll see in a moment. The nuclear waste is the single biggest problem. There are thousands of tons of nuclear waste that is just being stored at plants around the country. The waste will provide us an excellent practice problem for the online quiz that's on Blackboard. The problem ultimately comes from the fact that uranium-238, which is the bulk of the material, will actually undergo neutron capture. Uranium-238 does not produce any energy, but it undergoes uranium or neutron capture, which I, I did for you in practice problem. And so it becomes uranium-239, and then it undergoes two beta decays after that. 
See if you can figure out the two beta decays. What's the final product after two beta decays of uranium-239? So there's our starting material, uranium-239. It's a beta decay, we, put, we get an electron, and we get a new element. The element number goes up one, we get NP, neptunium, it's element 93 in the periodic table. The neptunium will be the reactant down here. Another beta decay, another electron coming out, and the final product is probably one you've heard of before. It's element 94, it's plutonium. And so plutonium 239. This was actually the radioactive material that was used in the second atomic bomb dropped at the end of World War II, it was the plutonium bomb. And we'll see the half-life of this is a problem because it's 24,000 years, and there is a lot of contaminated material that contains plutonium-239 stored right at the plants. We don't have a long-term solution. And so thinking about half-life, this came up earlier in chapter 13. The half-life of that plutonium-239 it's 24,000 years. And so the question here is what percentage will be left in 96,000 years? If you had 100% today, uh, 96,000 years from now, how much will be left? And here's a picture from your textbook to help you think about half-life again. For example, let's say there are a million of them. The half-life is a staggeringly long 14 billion years. After that much time, half a million is left. After another 14 million years, another half is gone, so we're down to a quarter of the original. If you wait a third half-life, then you're at an eighth. If you wait a fourth half-life, then you're down to one sixteenth. So as a percentage, we keep cutting it in half. We go 150, second half-life 25 of the original, third half-life 12 and a half, then finally, 6.25% will be left. As a fraction, it's 1 16th. We do not have a long-term plan to deal with this waste that is sitting at the plants, so this is a question for us for the future. Do we decide to close all of our nuclear power plants that we have operating now, or do we build more? These are questions that society has to face. Here's a little half-life extra credit problem. And so you can take a picture of this or make a sketch in a notebook or something. This is not in your notes booklet, but you can make a sketch of it. And so here's your probably last chance, I guess, for the semester on a little bit of extra credit. This will be due, this will be due by Monday the 27th, uh, by midnight. And so I'll step aside a little bit or you can pause the video, but there's a radioactive sample that you're given the half-life, and it wants you to make a sketch of what the containers look like on the left and the far right. And so this, like I said, will be due on Monday the 27th. Here's a little geopolitics comparing North Korea, Iran, thinking about nuclear weapons. And the, there's a figure at the bottom of the page there, and it shows you how you can take uranium-235 and make a bomb, or plutonium-239. Once someone has this material, uh, making a bomb is still fairly difficult, but many countries can do it. It's getting the raw materials that are the real problem. And so here are two paths to doing this. You can take some pure uranium ore. If you've ever, ever read an article from the news about this, sometimes they mention something called yellow cake, something that's pure uranium ore. Most of it is uranium-238, which just makes waste. And so one path, and this was the path that Iran was accused of trying to do at one time, is you purify it up to a high percentage of uranium-235 using really long centrifuges. 
because the heavier isotope will settle out sooner in a centrifuge, and you have to keep doing it and doing it, and you need really long centrifuge tubes. And then you can purify it and you can make a bomb. That's path one. The United States did that in the first atomic weapon they dropped the end of World War II. Path two is you can purify the uranium-235 to maybe 3% or around there. Then you operate a nuclear power plant for a while, and then you isolate the plutonium-239, which you can do chemically, it's not that difficult, and then you can make that into a plutonium-239 bomb. That's the path North Korea has taken, and they have made and tested several nuclear weapons. And so those are the two paths. This is the path we chose for the second bomb we dropped at the end of World War II. And so there's, North Korea is in the news a lot. And you hear some things occasionally about the Iranian nuclear deal uh, that we were in at one time. And so those are the main paths, but it's really getting this material. That's the hard part. So here is some practice for part two of chapter 19. A couple of multiple choice questions on 802, and here are some end of chapter book problems. Um, they deal with bombardment reactions and using E equals MC squared. Make sure you're in kilograms in those. And extra note here, I would recommend for problem 37, you really need to know the mass of the neutron, and it's not given in the problem. So one neutron is this many grams per mole. And earlier in the lecture, we rounded that to 1.009, but here we use the whole number, 1.00866. And the rest of the information is given in the problem, but you need that number. And that closes out chapter 19. And actually, if you turn the page, um, at the very end, I have some sort of deep questions to ponder. It's called my parting shot for the semester. It's on photons, energy, mass, the universe. And one of the things I always liked about college was sitting around with friends, thinking about big stuff like this. And so hopefully you can read my parting shot and then think deeply about some big questions and maybe we can even talk about them on Zoom, because I think that's one of the funnest things about college, is just talking big stuff with friends. You know, why are we here? Where are we going? Who knows? And so I appreciate your patience in all of these trials and tribulations we've been going through. Uh, feel free to drop in on Zoom, and then we'll be wrapping up the course in the next uh, week or two.